It's really about how do we handle structural connections. So we've talked a lot about how to find stresses in, in structural members, but those structural members have been idealised. We haven't considered uh, little cutouts and um, defects that are introduced by windows or joining in this case. Uh, so we'll t look today at, at how we handle loads in joints and why joints are the most critical part of the entire structure. Uh, a lot of the examples are from Flabelle today. So there's a few copies of this floating around in the library, I think. Uh, it's the name and all the details are in the course outline. So don't freak out and try and copy the details down now. Um, it's an extremely good book for anyone who's planning on having a future as a stress engineer. Uh, it's in Imperial Units, which is um, not too bad given that half of this course is in Imperial Units. Uh, it's useful to learn how to use them. Uh, and so some of the examples today will be in Imperial Units as well. But I have um, stolen a few of the images from this book um, under fair, fair use provisions, but to give for Belly's credit, I think you should go and buy, buy a copy of this book if you're interested. So um, we'll get started. Okay, so the first section is on bolted joints and we'll talk about bonded joints at the end if we get a chance. Now, the simplest case of a bolted joint is what we call a single lap bolted joint. So there's two sheets of metal or composite that come together and they're bolted together with a single row of fasteners. So if you look, this is just a cross section of one fastener, but if you look top down there'd be a, oh, hang on, there'd be a row of these fasteners. Okay, so we've got two sheets of metal coming together. So the plan view, there'd be a row of these. Now, single lap bolted joints are not particularly efficient. One of the problems with them is that there's, an, there's a built-in eccentricity in the loading. So if you look up here, the, the, if I was to apply a, a force on that panel and a force on that panel, there's an offset between those two forces. There's a, there's a distance between the two of them. So there's a, there's a moment created and that moment tries to uh, induce bending across the bolt. Now we can remove that in some part if we've got some backing structure. So if we've got two uh, bits of structure that we have to splice together, we can do so at a frame or a rib or some other piece of structure that's in behind and that will help aid taking that moment out of the joint. The next most complicated joint we can consider is what we call a double lap bolted joint. And we don't bolt two bits of structure together. Uh, together. We, we use what we call a doubler plate and or two doubler plates. And the primary structure maintains a straight load path. We put plates on either side and those plates are generally half the thickness of the primary structure and we bolt on both sides. Now we call this double lap because there's a double overlap. There's, there's an overlap at the top and there's an overlap at the bottom. And if we took one section of that and we had a closer look at it, there's no net bending moment in that joint. If the load's equally shared between the top and the bottom, there's no sort of external bending moment. So we don't get the, the bending effects that we do in single lap joint. Another way that these bolts could be loaded is in tension. So it's something that we should generally avoid. Uh, and I'll explain in a minute why we should avoid it. And there will be some tension across every joint. We call it secondary tension, but we, we generally try and avoid loading joints primarily in tension, or bolted joints at least. In some cases, it's not we can't avoid it. 
Uh, so, but we just have to use special tension fasteners to do it. Now, bolted joints for aerospace structures work slightly differently to the way they do in uh, mechanical engineering structures or civil engineering structures. In uh, a mechanical engineering structure, generally when we put a bolt in, the bolt often has a rolled thread. And a rolled thread protrudes from the shaft of the bolt unless we pre-taper the, the bolt. And what that means is that the hole that we drill has to be bigger than the shank of the bolt because otherwise the threads won't fit through. So if we, we over drill the hole, we put the bolt through and we tighten up the nut, how, if we pulled on one side of this, we pulled on the other side of it, how is load transferred through this joint? Well, primarily, load is transferred via friction. So what happens is when we tighten this up, we actually push down on the top and we push up on the bottom and we clamp the two bits of material together. So there's a sort of a compressive load introduced in a conical region underneath the, underneath the bolt head and the bolt tail. And we create a friction, for, fi friction stresses in here. So the load comes in, transfers through friction and out the other side. Now, the problem with that is that it relies on the bolt being under tension constantly. And if the bolt becomes a little bit loose, then its load carrying ability drops pretty quickly. And it's not as efficient as it could be. That friction, the friction stresses there are uh, not as strong as if we loaded material primarily. So what we tend to do in aerospace structures In aerospace structures, even though the threads are, might be rolled, they pre-taper the bolt. So the bolt before it's rolled, the thread is rolled, looks like this. So when you roll the thread, the thread still ends up narrower than the shank of the bolt. So when you, can, when you put a bolt in the hole, it can fit snugly against the sides of the hole. 
So now we can have load transfer that doesn't rely on friction, although we still use friction a little bit to give us some bonus load carrying capacity. When we pull on the left now, this bit of material over here pushes on the shank of the bolt. Okay, so that whole bit of material is being pulled to the left. And likewise, when we're pulling on the right, that pushes on the shank of the bolt. So the load is transferred as shear stresses through the fastener itself. The fastener is actually carrying load rather than friction carrying load. And it relies on us having very tight tolerances. If we've got um, poor tolerances between our bolt and the hole that we drill, then that load carrying efficiency drops quite significantly. Now one of the benefits of this is that it doesn't induce, we don't need as much tension because we're not relying on friction to carry the loads. So we don't run as high risk of cracking starting in the threads here. Because these threads are a stress concentration because we've rolled a, a weird shape into them and there's a high likelihood that cracking can start there. So if we avoid overloading our bolts in tension, just carry load in shear through the fastener, then we can get the maximum efficiency out of our bolted joints. Okay, so we'll talk in a, in a little bit about how to uh, calculate some of the strengths of joints, but I just want to introduce the parameters that we'll use in our discussion. Generally, when we bolt two plates together, we characterize the strength of a joint by doing a single fastener test. And that single fastener test looks something like this. We put a hole in a piece of material and put a fastener through it. But the, the dimensions we use to characterize that are the diameter of the hole, the width of the plate, and the width is also equal to the stiffener pit, uh, the fastener pitch. So if we had imagined a whole row of joints, If we imagine a row of these fasteners, then the pitch here is also equal to the width that we're talking about up there. So because if I, if I cut a strip of this out, then I end up with my single fastener test. And the thickness of the, the material, we, we give the value T. Now, if you look in design handbooks for designing joints, they'll generally tell you minimum values for some of these. So they'll say the minimum uh, width to diameter ratio or the minimum edge distance to diameter ratio. Because you can imagine if some of those values are too small, you'll induce very high stresses. So if your edge distance was too small, you, the bolt would just pull out through the, through the end of the uh, panel. Or if your width was too small, you would just crack it in tension. And the primary failure modes that we'll consider are these ones. So tension failure, if we took this little strip of material that I've cut out, sliced out of our row of joints and twisted it around so it was facing up the board and pulled on it, then we can get tension failure. And tension failure is equivalent to basically unzipping our entire joint. So you just break the material the whole way down the middle of the joint. Shear out failure is if all of these little plugs of material shear out and you've, you've effectively ripped the bolts out of the side of the plate. Both of those are not good failure modes for our structures to have because they're catastrophic. So once they've happened, there's no strength left at all. And when you're designing uh, aircraft for ultimate loads, 
Generally, the ultimate load is a transient thing. It won't be around for very long. The design regulations say the aircraft has to hold the ultimate load for three seconds. So when the load disappears, we still want some strength left in our structure. We don't want that overload to be the end of the aircraft. We want, even if there's some deformation and some damage, we still want some load carrying capacity uh, when the load goes away. So the, the failure mode that we generally aim for is bearing failure. And bearing failure is local deformation of the material ahead of the bolt. So you get some local yielding of material where if the, bolt, if the plate's pushing on the bolt and the bolt's pushing on the plate, then you'll get yielding in this zone ahead of the, ahead of the bolt. So if we pull on the plate here, the plate's pushing against the bolt, the bolt's pushing back, and you'll get plasticity and yielding and damage in there. And that's what we call bearing failure. And the name bearing comes from the, that there's load bearing on that face. Now, the last type, which is uh, also not a great failure mode, is fastener shear. So instead of the, the plates themselves failing, the fastener itself shears off. And there's some other failure modes as well, but they're harder to analyze, so we've, I've left them out of the notes for today. But if you're interested in this area, you can, you can look up more detail on, on fastener failure. So we can work out roughly ways of calculating the strengths of these different failure modes for a joint based on the input parameters that we had. We also need a few material allowables as well. So the diagrams on the next couple of slides, I've taken a a free body diagram where I've considered just one strip of material that's, the, that's our standard width W with a hole diameter D and I've taken the fastener out of the hole, I've just got the hole itself and the third dimension has got the thickness as before And I'm just considering the case where if I pull on this end with a load P, then the bolt pushes back on the inside of the hole here with an equivalent total force P. So I've got just the plate of material in equilibrium. Now, the ultimate net tension failure strength is reasonably easy to find because if I take a free body diagram of just this piece here which is what I've drawn as the bottom diagram there I've got a force P pushing on the on the bearing surface I have to somehow react P on 2 on one side P on 2 on the other side, so there's a, for, for this piece to stay in equilibrium, the, the plate has to pull back with force P in the same way as the bolt's pushing with force P. So the area of material that I'm re reacting with here, that I've made the cut here, is, is given by that formula up there. So it's the area left over is the width of the plate minus the diameter of the hole times the thickness of the, the plate. So this is the, the area of this cut surface here. Now, I'm going to drop into Flabelle's notation because this is the, the examples I'll use are from this book. So in a lot of American texts, F is 
confusingly for stresses and P is for forces. And capital F is for allowable stresses, so stresses that uh, the material can critically withstand and little f's are for applied stresses and the same with p. Capital P for allowable, little p for applied. So just like if you were to, if someone said uh, material is carrying a stress of 100 megapascals but its yield stress is 200 megapascals, the equivalent in this case is the the applied is 100 and the allowable is 200. So we're comparing what's in the material to what's, what it can withstand. Okay, so the allowable force that this joint can carry in net tension for, for, to avoid net tension failure is given simply by a material allowable, so the net tension ultimate strength of the material. This is something we can look up in a material data sheet times the area of material that's withstanding the load. Okay, so that's nice and easy. So if, some, if we wanted to know how much force each fastener could carry, we can work it out from that. Now, shear out failure is a little bit trickier, but with shear out we assume that the bulk shears out of the plate equally, or it's, there's, no, uh, there's no eccentricity to it. So it's equivalent to failing two cuts of material like that. So if, if the bolt pushes on this piece of material, the, the load it would take to just push that piece of material straight out is the load it would take to shear those two surfaces. And the way that we can measure that, if we give this a length L and the plate has a thickness T, then the force that's carried by one of these cuts is length times thickness times the ultimate shear stress of the material. So that's what the FSU stands for allowable because it's capital F. S for shear and U for ultimate. And because we have two of the cuts we have to make, we can say that the force is twice that. So if we wanted to work out uh, the margin of safety for any of these, the margin of safety is the allowable stress over the applied stress minus one. And occasionally there's another factor in there. So in this case, it's the allowable shear ultimate stress over the applied shear stress minus one. And in the same way on this previous slide, the margin of safety in this case, because stresses are harder to measure here, we could do it in forces as well. Okay, capital P for allowable tension ultimate force over the applied tension force, minus one. Now margin of safety is like a safety factor, but if it's greater than zero, the structure is not going to fail. 
if it's less than zero, the structure is going to fail. So if this is less than zero, it means that the applied load is bigger than the allowable load. So our structure is in trouble. If it's greater than zero, the allowable load is greater than the applied load. Now for bearing, we introduce a new material allowable, which is one you wouldn't have seen before. We define a bearing ultimate stress. And this is something that's measured empirically. It's not necessarily a first principles strength of the material. And it's written in Flabel as F um, BRU, bearing ultimate. So that's something you can look up in a data sheet. And the way to get from a stress to a force is it's normalized by the projected area that the bolt is pushing on. So if we imagine there was a bolt in here. It's pushing on an area that's D wide and T thick. Okay, because this goes in and out of the board T and it's D wide. Now the margin of safety in this case has an extra factor built into it. The margin of safety is the allowable bearing ultimate over the applied bearing ultimate times this K, which they call a fitting factor. And what the K accounts for is that the hole can never be exactly the same size as the fastener that's, applied, that's put in there. There's always got to be some clearance in there. So you're allowed some extra tolerance. So it means that the applied force can't be quite as high as it could be if it was a perfect joint. Now you can get tables of this K depending on the type of fastener that you're putting in and the the tolerances that you're using. Now the last one of our failure modes that we'll use in a minute is uh, fastener shear failure. So this is if the, as if we've taken the fastener and pushed too hard on the top and at the bottom and we've sheared the middle out of the, the fastener like I've shown up there. And the area that we're shearing is pi d squared on 4. Where d is the fastener diameter. Okay, so we've just taken the, we're shearing the whole circular area of the fastener. So to get to a force, and I'm, the force will be a shear ultimate in this case, we have a shear ultimate strength for the material times the area that we're shearing. And there's another correction factor, which is written here as CR. This is for thin plates. And again, this is an empirical factor. People have tested a lot of plates and worked out that the formula doesn't work perfectly. And have just applied a little fudge to it to make sure it works for, th for thin structures. And the margin of safety, just like before, is the uh, shear ultimate strength of the material over the applied shear minus one. <coughs> 
Okay, so armed now with an understanding of how our joints are going to fail, we can start looking at some different structural applications of these joints and see if we can work out how strong they are. So the first thing we need to do is work out how much load actually goes through every fastener. So I'll consider first and foremost just our single row joint. And I haven't got a slide for this. Okay, so I'm only going to show one half of it. These are the holes that have been drilled for the fasteners. So we've just got a regular single lap joint. So I've only shown half, obviously, the other half of the plates out here. But I've just removed all the fasteners and I'm just looking at how the fasteners react the loads. So in each one of these holes, the bolts are pushing back on the plate. So what's the tension stress on each, or sorry, the tension force on each one of those fasteners? And remember this is a repeating system, these are all W apart. So how do we go about solving this, well we need to extract just one strip of this material out and do a free body diagram. Sum of forces equals zero. We have P acting to the right minus sigma T times what? How do we go from a stress to a force? Yeah, so what area is this is that stress acting over? W. And what's the other dimension? So the force in each fastener in this case is just the tensile stress times the stiffener pitch, which I've called W here, but it's written as different things in different places, but that's the spacing between stiffeners times the thickness. <coughs> 
So what you might be tempted to do in this case, if you wanted to lower the force in every fastener, you might be tempted to say, well, we want to carry the maximum amount of stress that we can, so we can lower the force by reducing the spacing between the fasteners. If we put more fasteners in, each one is carrying a lower load. Uh, in practice, that doesn't really work because if we go too, if we reduce our W too much, we start failing the structure in net tension failure. Because if we look here, the strength that we can carry for each fastener is proportional to W minus D on T. So that's getting smaller quicker than this is getting smaller. On the flip side, if we wanted to avoid this failure, we could do so by spreading our um, fasteners further apart. But if we spread our fasteners further apart, eventually one of these two failure modes is going to kick in. Sorry, we're either going to get the fasteners shearing or we're going to get bearing failure. So really what we're trying to do is find the point at which the failure modes are all happening at there and thereabouts the same load. We want bearing failure to happen first because it's the non-catastrophic one. But we don't want the fasteners so far apart that, uh, that each fastener is overloaded. But we don't want them too close so that we get net tension failure. So the aim of designing a sensible joint is to work out that spacing so that we get a reasonable uh, performance from our joint. Now that's a very, very simple case and in most uh, joint applications we won't ever get something as simple as that. So I'll go into some more uh, complex applications of joints. And I'll, f I'll start simply first with what I call clip supports. Or what Flabelle calls clip supports. Now, clip supports are used to join transverse or perpendicular bits of structure or structure that comes together at an angle. And they're effectively a little bracket that goes around the corner that we bolt into one web and we bolt into the other web and they can carry tension or shear force. Now, on the left of each diagram here, we've got uh, tension clips because the force is pulling the clip in tension. So these are all tension clips. And on the right we've got shear clips because they're carrying shear forces. And in general shear clips are much stronger than tension clips because if we look closely in those tension clip cases, some of the fasteners are all going to be loaded in tension. We can't, in the shear clips, you don't have to load any fasteners in tension. We can have different geometry for them, which is what the three sets of pictures are. We have a single-sided case, a double-sided case, or a, an extruded case where we've actually got a T-bracket. Uh, and there's benefits to each, which we'll see as we go along. There's one other case which I'll show you a picture of in a second called a cord splice and that's used to carry uh, bending loads out of structures that have got significant bending in them. As I said, shear clips are far more efficient than tension clips and tension clips should be avoided if possible. We can't always avoid them and we'll talk about cases where we can't avoid them in a minute. Uh, and in this case, I'm only going to focus on the loads in the fasteners because the internal loads in the clips themselves are very difficult to calculate. You really need uh, numerical analysis. There's not many first principles ways of working out what the loads are. So 
I'm really looking at the loads in the fasteners themselves. So this is a uh, how we would join, say, a structure that had tension, shear and bending to another web that's travelling uh, across the board in here, or another C-beam that's travelling in this, this place here. Now, we have cord splices on the top and the bottom, and we have a shear and tension clip in the middle, or a shear clip in the middle. The clip carries the shear force, and these cord splices carry the tension and bending loads. Okay. Into, so the, the shear clip connects web to web, and the cord splices connect flange to flange. On some examples of shear clips, now I'm going to show on the document camera some pictures from Flabel that will match uh, what's up there. I just checked on Amazon and Flabel's about 70 bucks new. Um, so if you do want a copy of it, I suggest going. It's not, it's not the cheapest book, but it's also not the most expensive book. So, um, And it will be very useful for structures in your design projects, both in third year design and uh, fourth year design. Okay, so to introduce a sheep clip calculation, I'm going to use a, a, an example from Flabel. And basically, we're going to have a, some kind of intercostal beam. Here, what, what Flabel's called a transverse beam. connected to the closure beam. So basically two bits of two bits of transverse structure. Now the thing that connects them is our shear clip in here and we're, what we're going to try and do is work out the loads in those fasteners in that shear clip. And the force that we're going to apply is, is a shear force that will load, that will put shear through our fasteners. Now we could equally, as well as having a single-sided clip like we've got here, see it's only on one side of the, of the structure, we could equally have a double-sided clip as is shown here, or an extruded clip as, we're, as I've shown here. Okay, so this is, we'll just do a single-sided one, but then we'll do a, a double-sided and an a extruded version of the same calculation as well. Now, there's some assumptions, and it might seem like a reasonable list of assumptions, but they're all reasonably valid. That we assume that the clip geometry has been designed separately so that it's strong enough. We're not going to consider failures in our clip itself, just in the fasteners. The support structure on both sides only carries load in plane. Okay, so that means, remember, thin-walled structures carry load in plane, they don't carry load transverse. So we don't have to consider the fasteners pulling uh, on the web of the structure. It's just the loads that are pushing up and down in the plane. The failures that we'll consider are shear failure in the bolts that are connecting the clip and the structure, Bearing failure in the clip or bearing failure in the support structure. So both of those are only related to, to the force in the bolt itself. They're not related to any other any of the rest of the geometry of the clip. Or the, the thickness of the clip. But these are the three easiest ones to analyze. We could analyze for others, but we, we can't do it in a closed form way. We need numerical analysis. Now, what I'm showing up here is this case where I'm just showing the end of the, I'm showing the end here as if we're looking in along this beam here. Okay, so I've just taken a section in the vicinity of A here, and I'm showing it up on the on the slides. 
and I'll assume for argument's sake that the shear force at that section of the beam is P. And our free body diagram has got a section of the beam It's got a section of the beam here and it's got a section of clip Well, this is, this is the clip geometry which is not showing up for some reason Anyway, so this is the, this is the clip in here So what I've removed from the free body diagram, I've removed this piece of support structure that it's connecting to and I've removed most of this beam because I don't need it. So I'm representing the forces that are, that are, that the, the, the closure beam is applying to the clip via this reaction force here. Okay, so the reaction force is just the vertical shear force which is reacting uh, against the bolt forces. Okay, so if I take equilibrium of my entire free body diagram up there, then it's very simple that that R1 is equal to P. So the sum of forces in the vertical direction equals zero. So the reaction force from the closure beam is equal to the shear force in the transverse beam. Now, the next step, if we remove the uh, transverse beam and just consider the clip itself, then the forces at the centroid of the bolt group, so I'll erase all my ink here, If in the next case we get rid of the uh, transverse beam, I'll see if I can find the picture of it. That's no, exactly the same picture. We can react our reaction force, which is acting on the clip, with a shear force at the centroid of the bolts. And we can equate, again, that V equals R1, which equals the shear force that's applied to the transverse beam. And we also get a moment, because if we've got the clip just sitting in space like this... Hang on, that's terribly drawn. So the clip isolated by itself... You've got a force on the left, R1, and then a combined force from the fasteners, V. Now those two things also need a moment, because there's a, there's a moment disequilibrium there, so we also need a combined moment from the fasteners to keep our clip in equilibrium. So now the free body diagram for the clip itself looks like the little picture I've drawn down there on the lower left. And it's quite easy to do both of those moment equilibrium and force equilibriums. We've got both of those here. Okay. L is the distance from the edge of the clip to the centroid of our fastener group. And we'll talk in a minute about how to find the centroid of a fastener group. But for this case, it's just if there's only two fasteners, it's right in the middle of the two fasteners. So how do we split the forces between the two fasteners? Well, the shear component is just going to create a vertical force in both of them that's half of the total force. 
the moment component is going to create a horizontal force. So if we think, if we look at our little moment picture here, we've got a moment acting. If I draw my clip again, We had a moment, a total moment from the fasteners. We could easily replace that by. Sorry, I've just lost my screen again. We could replace that by horizontal forces at the fasteners themselves. So that's what we do here. Those horizontal forces are equal to the moment over the distance between the two fasteners. Now this little comment down the bottom says that if we've got more than two fasteners then we need some cleverer techniques and those other techniques we'll deal with at the end of the the lecture, but if we've got more than two fasteners on, on each side, we need to use a bolt group. And the bolt group calculation is a separate calculation. But two fasteners, it's very easy. So what we've found so far is we've managed to find the forces in two of the fasteners in our clip. Because if we sum vectorially V1 and P1, we can work out the total force in the fastener. The same for number two as well. So these two, these two fasteners, we can work out the load that they're carrying based entirely on the external load. Because if we look here, the moment is a function of P, the, sorry, the shear force is a function of P, the moment's a function of P, so we don't, Based on the shear force in this beam, we can work out the forces in the fasteners. There's two other fasteners here, which, if I go back to my document camera, if instead of looking in this way, if we look in this way, there's two fasteners that we can see on that side as well. And the free body diagram for that would look like what we've got here. And it's exactly the same calculation. So the forces, the vertical forces, are half the total shear force. The horizontal forces are the moment over the distance between the two. And it's exactly the same calculation. The only thing that changes is that this moment, which equals P... L over H. L and H are not unique. L and H are dependent on the actual geometry of each, of each case. So H is the distance between the fasteners and L is the distance from the edge of the clip. So let's do a simple example of that, just so we can put some numbers to it. So we'll consider exactly the same structure and the internal shear force P will assume is 100 pounds or 1,000 pounds. Let's make it 1,000 pounds. 
Now we'll simplify our clip as just a folded piece of metal. So a folded L bracket. With fasteners one, two, three, and four. Hang on, I better make sure I get the numbering the same as Lavelle in case you want to follow along. Sorry, he's numbered them the other way. One, two, three, four. Okay, and on this side is the transverse beam and on this side is the closure beam. Okay, but that doesn't really matter too much. Now, just to give us some dimensions, generally this will be, there'll be some projections of the clip drawn. Fasteners one and two, and we'll say that distance there is one inch. That distance there is two inches. And diameter one equals diameter two equals uh, a quarter inch. Okay. Now, I'll draw the other projection. So this is... This is the view from A. Oh, before that goes away. I'll draw the view from B down here. Now in this case, we'll assume that the fasteners are only 1.5 inches apart and that the distance from the edge is 1.5 inches. Just to give us a slightly different calculation. D3 equals D4 equals a quarter inch. Now, the centroid of the fasteners, because their diameters are the same, the centroid of the fasteners is just directly between the two of them. So, we don't need to worry about any complex calculations to work out where the middle of the fasteners is. We will later on. So, from our simple equilibrium equations we worked out before, R equals P equals a thousand pounds. So therefore V equals a thousand pounds and M equals what to maintain equilibrium here? 
it's a thousand times the distance up there, which is one inch. A thousand inch pounds. So now what we're going to do is replace our forces with the fasteners themselves. V1, V2, P1, P2. V1 equals V2 equals a thousand on two, so five hundred pounds. P1 equals P2 equals M over H. Thousand. What's H in this case? Two. Okay, so just by chance, that's also 500 pounds. That's only because the distance here was two. Okay, so if I want to work out P shear 1, where I'm going to use S to represent the total, PS to represent the total shear force in the fastener, how would I calculate it from those two? If it's got a vertical component of 500 and a horizontal component of 500, yeah, it's just Pythagoras. So it's the square root of 500 squared plus 500 squared equals root 2 times 500 should be about 707 yep. pounds. I don't know that because that's one on route two, basically. Anyway, um, PS2 equals the same thing. Okay, so if we just wanted to just update our free body diagram just to show what it looks like in the end. PS1, PS2. Okay. And that clip will now be in equilibrium. Now, I'll leave you to calculate the same thing for 3 and 4, but what I'll do now is I'll check whether... Uh, We'll, we'll extend this question a little bit and we'll, we'll tie in some failure mode analysis. Let's try and work out how thick the uh, clip needs to be if it's made from aluminium 2024 to avoid bearing failure. Okay, so we have a folded, folded AL 2024 T4 sheet. Thickness equals what to avoid bearing failure? 
Okay, so what, are we, what extra information are we going to need to solve this problem? So there's a couple of, there's one unknown on this screen that we, you're going to need and that's a material allowable. The material allowable you're going to need is this FBRU for AL 2024 sheet. Now I'm going to look it up in the back of Fabel because I can never remember it in Imperial units. Okay, it varies slightly for flat sheet or for coiled sheet, but We'll do, it's about 100 and, 110 KSI. Okay, it varies around a little bit, but it's close enough. Okay. The other thing I'll say that we'll aim for a margin of safety equal to 0.05 to give us a little bit of margin of safety. So, margin of safety equals PBRU, which I'll sub in the formula, FBRU TD over P shear, so we've just calculated P shear for the fasteners, K minus 1. So if we rearrange that, margin of safety plus 1 times PS times K all over FBRU D is this thickness that we're trying to find. Okay. So obviously the thicker the plate, the more force we can carry on the top, so the bigger our margin of safety is going to be. So, I'm not exactly sure whether the numbers for this are going to be sensible. I made this up on the spot, so we'll see. We, might, we may get a nonsensical thickness come out the other side, but... Inches? That seems very high. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's right. We've, remember, we've got KSI here instead of this is a thousand, a thousand PSI. Yep, so you're just out by a factor of a thousand. 0.03. Okay, so that's very thin. That's that's really beyond, that's lower than you would normally use for aircraft structure. So, in, in this case, we, will, uh, we had a little bit more capacity to carry load than the load that I applied at the beginning. Okay? So, sheets, typical sheet thicknesses are 0 0.05, 0 0.08. Okay? 
sheets like that kind of thickness. So we're on the thinner side of those. But you can, you, I mean, you can get thinner. You can get coiled sheet down to 0.01. So, but it's unlikely that we would make a bit of structure out of that. And as, a, as an, an extra question for doing later, can you work out the margin of safety in this problem for um, fastener shear? So you know the diameter of the fastener. The FSU that I, I'll give you now. FSU is about 37 KSI. And, and CR, just for the sake of this calculation, assume it's 1. Don't worry about any additional factors. Okay, so I'll leave that as a little exercise. It's really just applying the same techniques we applied here. Okay, so this is an exploded view of the problem we've just solved with some slightly more general uh, numbers on it. Okay, so if you want to see how it looks in three dimensions, this is what we just, the calculation we just did. Okay, we worked out the forces in one and two, and I've set it as an exercise for, for everyone else to do three and four. Labelle also goes on to analyse the problem assuming that we've got a double-sided clip and then assuming that we've got uh, an extruded clip. Now the double-sided clip has slightly lower forces in it because there's two sets of fasteners on the, on the closure beam and the extruder clip has even lower forces because the internal moments are reacted in the extruder clip and you don't, get you don't get the horizontal components being carried through to the closure beam. So if you, if you understand the example we just did thoroughly, then try and interpret these, the next two figures. Uh, they're just an extension of the same equilibrium theory. The only tricky bit is that the, with this extruder clip, you don't need horizontal forces because they're internally reacted in the, the extrusion. So even though we've got moments here, we don't have moments in this set of forces. It's only the vertical parts. Okay, so we'll quickly look at tension clips. There, I will probably leave out the tension clip calculation just because it's, a, it's not particularly interesting and it's a little bit uh, of a fudge anyway. But we'll talk generally about tension clips. There's two primary reasons that we'll use a tension clip. One of them is to carry loads from a stiffening member to another stiffening member through 
a bulkhead or something that we can't break. And another application is to carry pressure loads into a bulkhead or into a rib or a frame. And I'll draw some examples of those two things. We can have single clips where we've just got a single uh, bracket or we can have a continuous clip which is like a con continuous folded piece of um, spar cap or something along those lines or rib cap. If we know that there's going to be t significant tension loads in our fasteners, we need to use tension head bolts. The heads on the bolts are a little bit bigger to stop the uh, material being pulled off the head of the bolt. We also can get special uh, tension threads that are, the threads are a little bit more uh, tolerant of tension loads. <coughs> the stress concentrations are a little bit lower. And failure is either assumed to be the prying failure of the bolt, so the bolt just breaks due to what we call prying failure, get, it gets snapped in half, or bending failure in the clip. And neither of those two cases I'll do a calculation for, but I'll show you how the process would work. Okay. So, it might be a bit hard to visualize uh, what I'm showing here. There are lots of bits of aircraft structure which we call bulkheads, which uh, divide one part of the cabin from another or one part of the wing from another. And they're generally designed to contain a fluid, either pressurized air in the cabin or fuel in a fuel tank. But they're a divider that's not meant to have holes all through it. They're, they're a continuous piece of structure. And because they're continuous, we don't want to be opening up holes for our stiffeners to run through them. In most cases with a rib, the rib will actually have cutouts to allow the stiffener to run through it. Uh, because the stiffener is the more important bit of structure, it's the one carrying the primary flight loads, and the rib is only carrying secondary loads. When we get to bulkheads, which might be the end of a wing fuel tank, we can't cut a hole in the rib because if we cut a hole in the rib then the fuel's just going to leak out. We can drill a hole in the rib and seal it with a bolt on either side and we can make sure it's still uh, watertight or fluid tight. And that's what a case that I've shown here. If we've got a bulkhead which is the divider, so this is a bit of structure we don't want to break and we've got skin underneath it and we've got a stiffener that's running along and the stiffener is going to have some load in it. We can't just stop the stiffener because all the load will go into the skin and it will overload the skin. So what we do is we bring the stiffener up as close as we can on both sides of the bulkhead and put a tension clip through. And that tension clip carries the loads out of the uh, stringer through the bulkhead and back into the stringer on the other side so that we don't get a sharp discontinuity in our load. Another use is if we've got pressure forces, so aerodynamic pressures or uh, fuselage internal pressurization. If we have the skin which effectively is being pushed outwards by the internal pressure and we're trying to carry the load back into a bulkhead or into a frame, then along that boundary those fasteners are all being loaded in tension because the skin's being pushed outwards, the fasteners are trying to hold it back and you get a tension load generated along that line of fasteners. So both of those could be considered tension clips. And they're both present in this picture here. So although it's a bit hard to read, hopefully you can look at it in the notes. The, we've got uh, a pressure carrying tension clip here connected to a bulkhead and we've got a stiffener, some stiffener tension clips here and some other stiffener tension clips here which are carrying load through the bulkhead. So this detailed example shows two uses of tension clips and they're cases that we can't really avoid. If we've got a bulkhead, we've got to get our loads through it somehow so, so tension clips are necessary. <coughs> 
Now, a simple way to analyze the forces in one of these is if we know the, the force that's applied in tension, the way that they generally fail is through what's called prying failure. So if you just isolate the clip itself and the bolt, then the bolt will have some tension in it. The bracket will have some tension in it, but there's a, there's a moment discontinuity between the two. So to react the moment, there's some contact pressure which pushes back up on the clip to keep it in equilibrium. So this is the applied force. This is the reaction force from the bolt. But because of the moment created, we also need some other force acting upwards to keep it in equilibrium. Now, if we do our sum of forces, or sum of P's in this case, then we'll see that if we've got P plus PR minus PB equals zero, So the applied force plus this reaction force here minus the bolt force equals zero. It means that the bolt force is always greater than the applied force. This is one of the reasons that tension clips are a bad idea is that not only are you carrying the applied load, you're carrying the applied load and then some. You're carrying some extra load as well. So if we can avoid them, we should, but as I said, not always possible. The other way that these will fail is if the material here fails in bending. If this plane of material just, just bends around the bolt, and you can work out whether that's going to be the case by taking uh, just an equilibrium or free body diagram of just the piece of cut material using that as your free body diagram. Okay. So in both cases, it's, there's some fairly simple free body diagrams, but I won't go into it because I think there's some more important calculations I need to, need to get to. Okay. The next thing we'll consider is multi-row joints. So all the, the joints we looked at at the beginning were single row joints. Then we looked at some isolated fasteners in, in clips. Now we're going to consider multi-row joints. Now, because most people would say, well, if you've got one fastener that's failing, why don't you just put two in? And we'll see why that may not be such a good idea. Okay. By multi-row fastener, I mean that we've got two rows of fastening fasteners. So this is the bottom half of the of the thing we're bolting together. Okay. And if we isolate just the top plate and take the bolts out. Then whatever tension stress is acting on this side is being reacted by the fasteners like that. Okay, all the fasteners are pushing back on the plate. So you should immediately say, well, this can carry twice as much force as our single row joint, or can it? Well, it's, it's a tough question to answer. What we have to do is because we, we now don't have a static equilibrium anymore, we've got to work out how the forces in these fasteners are actually shared. And to do that, there, there is an example which I haven't put in the notes, but I will, I will upload it. Uh, an example where we can do 
effectively a little finite element analysis of this problem, a little uh, one-dimensional FEA to work out how those fasteners share their forces. And the question of how much stronger can we get multi-row joints over single row joints, or how many rows could you conceivably go up to? If this is stronger, then could we just keep putting rows of fasteners in? Why wouldn't our aircraft just be all fasteners? Why can't we just bolt big sheets of material together to make sure it's strong enough? Well, hmm? Yeah, could. <laughs> Well, the answer is that it's complicated. Uh, it's not an easy thing to say where the best number of rows to go to is. In practice, you can get some return from a second row of fasteners. You get a slightly smaller, well, you get a slight return, a pretty small return from a third row of fasteners. But in general, you'll just cost yourself weight and not get any more strength from a fourth or fifth row of fasteners. So, in practice, the most that you tend to go to in a structure is three, and I'll explain why that is. There's two problems here. We've got a problem with how the fasteners themselves share load, and we've got a problem with a thing called bypass load. Now, because I've got the, this diagram up, I'll consider bypass load first. So if we pull on this end with P, and let's assume for argument's sake that both of these, I'll do it 2P, both of these fasteners push back with force P. Just, it won't be exactly that, but we'll assume it, it's the case. Now we have a problem with what we call bypass load. The force at this plane The force reacted by the plate is P, or P on, two lots of P on two. But if instead we consider a cut through here, then the total force reacted on that plane is 2p. So the force reacted on this plane is 2p, force reacted on this plane is p. So if we think about how, how we're, if net tension failure is going to occur, we're still limited by the worst case plane. So net tension failure doesn't get any better by putting in multiple rows of fasteners. So you could put 10 rows of fasteners in and it's still going to be limited in the net tension across that plane. So that's what we call bypass load because the load here has to get back around the hole and so it's what we call bypassing the hole. So you can't win any battles with net tension failure by putting more fasteners in. You can win on bearing failure but you can't win on net tension failure. The second problem is load sharing. Now if we go back to our little picture here, 
And uh, I'm just trying to work out how to draw this. I'll do it. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm going to do is just draw the very, very top plate. So I've drawn this, this plate here isolated. Okay, so I've taken the bolts and everything out, remembering that there is material connected here. We're not just having these floating bits of plate hanging there. Okay, it's just not connected in this plane. Now, if the load was equally shared, the force here would be P on 3, P on 3, and P on 3. And from a bearing failure perspective, we could get away with a third of the thickness that we had before because the, the loads are reduced by a factor of three. In practice, when we do this, depending on the stiffness of the fasteners and the stiffness of the underlying material, generally the outermost fasteners get loaded significantly more than the middle fasteners. So this one would be, more, be closer to P on two, this one would be closer to zero, and this one will be closer to P on 2. So from a bearing failure perspective, there's not many returns on going above two rows of fasteners. So if you've got two rows of fasteners, they'll share it equally. But if you put third or fourth or fifth extra rows in, generally it's still your outer fasteners that will fail. So there's two reasons that we, we can't just go to an infinite number of rows of fasteners to make our joint stronger and stronger and stronger. The price we always have to pay to make our joints stronger, if we want them to be stronger, is to increase the thickness. And what does increasing the thickness do? Increases the weight of the aircraft. So the thing that we try to avoid as much as we can, because it's a thing that costs us all the fuel, is increasing this thickness. But to get the to strength that we need in some cases, that thickness has to be increased. look at fastener groups. So we looked at rows of fasteners, we looked at clip supports, we looked at multi-row fasteners. The last permutation I suppose is isolated groups of fasteners. If you've got, uh, this is a very complicated set of fasteners here, uh, that, but obviously that's some fairly complex structure that I wouldn't ask you to analyse. But there are situations where groups of fasteners get used to get together to carry a load between one member and another. And it's not a row of fasteners necessarily, it's just a group of things to bolt one uh, piece of structure to another, one bracket to another. Now, we need to, when we do these those type of problems, work out the centroid of the fastener group because the centroid of, fa of the fastener group is where the loads are going to transfer through uh, concentrically and the, the centroid can be found by this calculation here. It's really the air, it's a first moment of area effectively. It's the sum of the area times a position over the sum of the area but because our fasteners we're assuming are all circles we can get rid of the pi on 4 and just leave uh, d squared x over sum of d squared and the same with y, sum of d squared y over sum of d squared. And we'll do uh, an example of it later on, although I've said we'll do the example here, we'll do that in a minute. But it's a fairly simple process to work out the centroid. Now the assumptions we make when we do these kind of calculations are that there's no friction. Friction uh, does, means that our calculations aren't quite right. We're not really worried too much about stress concentration factors because we're only looking at the, the fasteners themselves. Bolts 
share load based on the weighting of the area within a group. So as I said, where fasteners, we, we need to look at uh, the statically indeterminate problem. In general, it's a reasonable assumption to assume that a fastener with a bigger area will carry more load. So the assumption that we make is that if you've got a bolt, two bolts and they're different sizes, they'll carry load proportional to their area. Any local bending is small, so we're not looking at problems where we've got tension on our bolts or only just looking at shear forces in our fasteners. Okay, so the simplest case is what we call concentrically loaded fasteners. So a concentrically loaded problem is where the line of action of the force acts through the centroid of our bolt group. And the load can very easily be determined then. It's just the total load times d squared for the bolt. So if say we we're trying to find the, the load in this fastener here, we would need, we'll call that fastener 1, we would need d1 squared over the sum of n equals, sorry, I'll raise that sum of i equals 1 to n of di squared. So we're adding up the areas of all the fasteners. So it's really just saying if we've got four equal sized fasteners, they'll each carry a quarter of the load. If we've got two big fasteners and two small fasteners, the bigger ones will carry more load and the smaller ones will carry less load. Again, I'll leave the example to this problem in a minute. The next problem is eccentrically loaded fasteners. So if we have a force that's line of action doesn't line up with a centroid of the group, for instance, if we had a bracket with some load applied to it that we're bolting onto a web, then there's a moment transfer through the centroid as well. And what we tend to do is we replace the external force by its reaction at the fastener group. So if we've got that external force F there, then we react it with two components of shear and one component of moment. We divide the forces, the shear forces, e equally among the bolts if the areas are equal. But if they're not equal, then we use the concentrically loaded formula. So we use this formula here because the two cases are concentric. We've made them concentric. P and V here, by the way we've chosen them, have to be going through the centroid because we've resolved them at the centroid. And then the moment is divided based on the distance from the centroid to a line, a line perpendicular to, to the fastener from the centroid. So that, that radius there. Okay. So for the simple case that I've shown down there, those would all be equal and they'd be equal to the, the applied moment or the, or the reacted moment times the radius to one fastener over the sum of the radii squared. Okay, sorry, there's a mistake in that formula. Let me just check that for a second. No, that's right. No, the formula's right. Because on top we have a moment times uh, a distance, and then on the bottom we have a distance squared, so we end up with a force, yes. That's right. Okay, and then once we've got these two sets of forces, we've got a set of forces here and a set of forces here. We add the two together to work out what the total force on each fastener is. <coughs> 
and then you identify the most highly loaded fastener and check for the different failure modes. Okay, so because we've got a moment, not all of our forces in the bolts are going to be equal anymore. The general version of all of these uh, formulae, which is in, given by Fabel, the general version of these formulae can be broken up into a table calculation. And we do a set of X calculations, a set of Y calculations, and we can combine them at the end to give us a total set of forces. So we work out the X centroid, the Y centroid, the forces in the uh, x direction, again, I think I've got a, a, a little mistake floating in here, which is, I seem to have to correct every time I use this slide. Um, sorry. I'll just fix it and put it back up again. Okay, so I changed in here, I changed um, to a V in there if you've got a copy of the notes going around because there was a, there was a P in there. Okay, so we have a, a vertical and a horizontal component of uh, forces, shear forces. We have a, an X and a Y component of moments or forces due to the moments and then we add those up and then we resolve the total vectorially. So it's a reasonably involved process and you generally use a table solution to, to solve it. So what we'll do is I'll, I'll show you a problem in uh, Flabel and we'll go through the centroid calculation, through the, all of this calculation and we'll work out the total forces in the fasteners. Okay, so the problem is this one. And I've got another picture of it here in Flabel. So we've got a pulley, which is here with cables pulling on the pulley, connected to a bracket. And that bracket is bolted into uh, some kind of auxiliary beam structure, which is mentioned up here. Okay, and the fasteners one, two, three, and four are not of equal sizes. So fasteners one and three are BJ6 rivets, and fasteners two and four are BJ5 rivets. And the task is to find the loads in all the fasteners and then work out whether there'll be any bearing failure or fastener shear failure. So it's quite a long calculation. And this is a side view. Okay, so here's our, here's our support structure. We're looking in um, from, from this direction. We can see the bracket bolted through and there's the pulley acting in the plane of the fasteners. Okay, so we don't have to worry about moments or anything like that. We're really just looking, or well, out of plane moments, we have to consider in plane moments. So, I'll turn this off. 
Now, just take note, the diameter of fasteners 1 and 3 is 0.191 inches, and the diameter of fasteners 2 and 4 is 0.159. And if they sound like strange numbers, it's because they're slightly undersized based on a standard fraction of an inch. So 0.191 is probably, uh, let me think about how many, what fraction that would be. But they're, they're un slightly undersized on a particular fraction of an inch. Okay. I, I can't tell you what fraction that is off the top of my head. Okay, so the first task is to work out the centroid. Actually, sorry, the first task is to work out the reactive react forces. So let's do that. Okay, so on our pulley, we want to work out what force the bracket has to apply to our pulley to keep it in equilibrium. Then the next, we do an equal and opposite sum, and the force that the, the bracket applies to the pulley is equal and opposite to the force that the pulley applies to the bracket. Now because there's a pulley here, if we take moments about the centre, the moment's going to be zero because there's no, no moments, the tensions in the two cables are the same, so we don't have to worry about moments here. So, sum of forces in the x direction, where we'll just assume x is across the board, equals zero. So 400, let's just call this R. 400 plus 400 cos 35 minus Rx equals 0. Rx equals... Sum of forces y equals zero. Uh, Ry minus four hundred sine thirty-five equals zero. Ry equals. I've got 728 and 229. Okay, so as I said before, if we now looked at our weirdly shaped bracket, which I can never draw very well. Always ends up looking a bit phallic. Uh, 
Um, the reaction forces that the pulley, the force that the pulley applies to the bracket is equal and opposite the force that the bracket applies to the pulley. Okay, and we end up having to, this will be fastened into the, uh, into the beam. And so we need to react this force at the centroid of the bolt group. Okay, and I haven't drawn the vectors the right way, but that's the next task. But the first task we have to find is we have to work out where that centroid is. First task we have to solve. Okay, so a t tabular solution is the best way to start this. And we have to find the centroid relative to something. We're, we're not finding the centroid in an arbitrary space. We're finding it relative to a particular fastener. So the easiest place to start is one of the fasteners and find it relative to that. So if we say you find it relative to fastener 2. So it's generally good practice if you're writing exam paper to actually say what you're doing. Okay, find centroid location relative to fastener number two. Using table. Okay, so what fastener one, two, three, four. We need their diameter. We need their x, their y d squared x, well we'll do d squared first, d squared, d squared x, and d squared y. Okay, and I already said 0 0.191, 0 0.159. Okay, so let's go through this. Relative to fastener 2, what is the x location of fastener 1? Hmm? Zero. What's the x location of fastener 2 relative to fastener 1? Oh, so relative to fastener 2, sorry. Zero. Three and four? 1.2. Now, y's... 0.96, 0, 3 is 0.96, and 4 is 0. Okay, so now you can calculate the rest of this. And at the bottom here, we're going to need a sum of d squared, we're going to need a sum of d squared x, and we're going to need a sum of d squared y. 
I'll do the ones I know how to do. Okay, I've got a cheat sheet in front of me, so I've already got these sums worked out. Um, yeah, it's good if you can get the same value, because I'm pretty sure Flabelle's got this one right. Um, so, now how do we calculate the centroids? X equals sum of X bar, or XCG, sum of D squared X over sum of D squared y bar sum of d squared y over sum of d squared. So we do the two divisions. Now the x1 should be easy to work out because it's going to be right in the middle. Okay, so the XCG is 0.6 inches and the YCG is 0.56 inch, six, six inches, both positive, which means that they're both to the right and above faster than two, which is what you'd expect. You know, the centroid is not going to be outside the bolt group, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Okay, so we've now got a centroid location, which is right. Here somewhere, if my pen will let me work, right? Okay. It's equally spaced between one and three, but it's a little bit closer to the top than it is to the bottom. And we've resolved our pulley forces to 728 this way. And what was the other value? 229 that way. So now our task is to work out what the reaction forces here are Y, R, X, and the moment are going to be. And the moment, I'm just going to assume at the moment, is clockwise, but I don't know. I'd have, to, I'd have to actually work that out. I think it will be clockwise in this case. But until I do the sums, I don't know that for sure. So what's our Y going to be? In this case, yeah, what's Rx? 
728. They're easy to do. The moment's a little bit trickier. Okay, so we need a moment equilibrium equation. Now, where's the easiest place to take moments about? Yeah, generally the centroid, just so we can get rid of the two reactions. Okay. So, sum of moments about the CG, clockwise positive equals zero. Always useful to write in what you're actually doing with your... Calculation. So, moment, the unknown moment we're trying to solve. Now, what's the moment, the 229 down here, is that a clockwise moment or an anti clockwise moment? Clockwise. So, plus 229 times the moment arm. And how will we work out the moment arm? The easiest way is to work out the distance from 2 and then subtract the CG away. So it's 1.2 plus 1.27 minus 0 0.6. Now the moment of the, the Rx at the bottom, or the force at the bottom, is going to be anti-clockwise, so it'll be negative. Minus 728 times, in this case we're going to have 1.65 plus the Cg, which was 0 0.566 equals 0. M equals I've got eleven eighty five inch pounds. So our problem is now to take these fasteners, one, two, three, and four, and apply to them a set of forces that look like this. And work out how each of those fasteners shares that set of forces. So we'll do this with a series of tables. And most of the tables end up they look fairly similar to start with and then they have different columns in them towards the end. So again, let's say what we're doing. Find x 
component of shear force from R X. One, two, three, four. D, D squared, now just to be um, compliant with Flabelle's notation, I'm going to use the subscript P here, which he uses for horizontal shear force. Okay, so if you're using the formulas from the formula sheet, horizontal shear force. So 0 0.191, 0 0.159, 0 0.191, 0 0.159. You've got your D squared from the previous table which you can just fill in. And what will you need? Well, we're solving... We're doing this calculation here. So you'll need a sum of d squared. which you had from before. And then each force is the external force times its own d squared divided by the sum of d squared. So let's just do the first one. So for 1, d squared is 0 0.0365. So PS P1 equals 728 times 0 0.365 over 0 0.1236. I'm missing something here. I've got to have an extra zero in there. 0, 0.3. Hmm? So that should equal 215 pounds. Now what we've got to remember is that these also, as well as having a magnitude, they have a direction. So when we do the final sums later on, we've got to be very careful about the direction that these all have. So at the moment we don't need to worry too much, but when we get to the final summing everything up, direction will really matter. Okay, I won't do the calculations, but we can do the same thing for Y. So you can do exactly the same thing. Find Y component of shear force from RY. So the last thing we have to do is find the components of shear force from our moment. Then we have to sum everything up at the end. So 
The moment calculation is a little bit trickier because we're, we need to know distances because remember uh, the moments are shared not only by d squareds but they also have a distance built into them as well. Okay, and a distance in the bottom as well. So the table looks slightly different. So let's go through the calculation for number one. Now, the, this x bar is the distance from, of number one from the centroid in the x direction. So it's 0.6. We're not going to worry about moment directions at this stage. We'll assume everything's positive. And when we get, come to do our sums at the end, we'll work out what direction they're facing. The distance of fastener 1 from the centroid in the y direction is 0.96 minus 0.566, which gives us 0 0.394. The radius is just the distance from the centroid to 1, which is just Pythagoras, this squared plus this squared, and take the square root. d squared x bar we can calculate, d squared y bar we can calculate. d squared r squared we can calculate now let's do the sample calculations for the two forces so the two forces ps mx is equal to the moment times d squared times y bar or y over sum of d squared r squared. So I'll tell you the sum of d squared r squared is 0 0.072. So, our moment was 1185. Our d squared y for this fastener is 0 0.0144. And our sum of d squared r squared is 0 0.072. Which should come out to be 237 pounds.
now we've got to put the whole thing together. And this is where some diagrams are going to come in handy. Uh, for that R. Um, for the yeah, so for the moment we're just taking everything absolute value and we'll look at we'll look at signs in the last like when we put it all together. So everything's just positive at the moment. So let's look at where our X forces are coming from. We've got shear, we've got moment, and we have the sum of the two. Okay, so the reaction force in the x direction looked like this. So depending on whether we consider the forces that the brackets apply to the bolts or the bolts apply to the brackets, it doesn't really matter, but as long as we're consistent, I'll use Flabel's uh, case now. So what we're trying to find is the forces that the bolts apply to the bracket. So if the force on the bracket is that way, then the forces in the bolts are going to react that. Doesn't matter whether you do reactions or uh, res resultants as long as you're consistent. So the X forces, if the reaction force was pointing to the left, the X forces in all the fasteners are going to be to the right. Now the moment. Which way was the moment about the CG? Clockwise? So which way the X component force is going to go if they're reacting that? Well, at the bottom they're going to be going to the right and at the top they're going to be going to the left. So this is why I say we don't worry about signs when we're doing the tables. We just work out our signs now. So as an example sum, we found that this was 215 and this was 239. Or 237 maybe, 237 sorry. So, what's the total X force on fastener 1? Hmm? Negative 22. So it's acting this way, it's going to have a magnitude of 22 pounds. And you can do that for all the X's. 
Then you can do it for the y's. Now the y forces, if the reaction was this way, the force on each of the fasteners is going to be downwards. If the moment was clockwise, then the reaction forces are going to be upwards on the right and downwards on the left. And so you can sum those up. Then you do a sum of this right hand column. So if you've got x's plus y's equals the total vector of force. Okay, so you get x due to shear force, x due to moment y due to shear force, y due to moment, the total sum of the x's, the total sum of the y's, and then the total vector sum of the x and y. So you end up with some very big tables. Once you've got your total vector sum of your x and y, then you can pick the biggest one, and you can compare the largest force to see to the bearing load and the fastener shear load for that particular problem. So in Flabel, the thicknesses of the structure are defined. So I've defined the thicknesses here. So you can look at the bearing stresses uh, in the in the structure. <coughs> 